All right, this is gonna be an introduction to the respiratory system, specifically breathing mechanics. So how do muscles contract and relax um, to cause inhalation and exhalation? And the first concept here is um, there are a handful of muscles involved in breathing. By far the most important is the diaphragm, right? Um, diaphragm is a muscle that is basically tracing the border between the thoracic and the abdominal cavity. So if this is our diaphragm, it almost looks like a dome or a tent, right? Lungs are up top. All of your abdominal contents are obviously down here. And when the muscle contracts, remember, muscles can only do one thing. They can try to get shorter. And so when the diaphragm contracts, it's going to draw down, right? And go to a lower position. The only option your lungs have is to go along for the ride, right? So the diaphragm basically acts like a suction cup. Um, it's not physically attached to the lungs in any way. But when it goes down, lungs go along with it. And the result of that is that you get an increase in lung volume, right? Remember, this is the, the same principle as what you saw in the heart. When the ventricles contract, their volume goes down because they're squeezing inward. Um, the diaphragm is different. It's like a vacuum. Um, their volume goes up. And since volume and pressure have an inverse relationship, when lung volume goes up, um, pressure goes down, right? So the increase in volume causes a decrease in pressure, right? The pressure outside of the lungs is what we'll call atmospheric pressure, right? Atmospheric pressure changes if you go up and down mountains or in an airplane, but breath to breath, it doesn't change. So the atmospheric pressure is what it is. What that means is if the pressure in your lungs is going down, we've got a gradient now, right? If lung pressure went down, that means that we have relatively high pressure out here. And just like blood always flows from high to low pressure, air always flows from high to low pressure. And so diaphragm contracts, volume goes up, pressure goes down. That draws air into the lungs along this high to low gradient, right? Air enters, your lungs fill with air as we want. Um, that's inhalation. Now, the other way that this can happen is it's not just diaphragm. Um, there are also muscles in the ribs called intercostals. Um, your external intercostals can also elevate the rib cage so the top of the lungs go up, but it's the same thing. Um, whether your rib cage is going up or your diaphragm is going down, either way, we're increasing volume, decreasing pressure. All right, now, when you're going to exhale um, for just relaxed, calm, normal breathing, you don't really need muscles to exhale. All you have to do is relax. Relax the diaphragm, it goes back up. Relax the intercostals, lungs come back down. Um, during the exhale, the opposite will happen. You'll get a decrease in volume and an increase in pressure. And the result is we flip our gradient. Now, right, the entire gradient is going to be backwards, right, high inside the lungs because we just made pressure go up relatively low in the atmosphere. The atmosphere didn't actually change. It's just lower than the lungs now, right? Air gets pushed back out, exhale or expiration, right? And if you want to breathe out even harder, right, you can contract your abdominal muscles um, and the internal intercostals, right? Abdominal muscles are going to squeeze on the abdominal cavity and force the lungs up even harder. That would be like blowing up a balloon, um, blowing out birthday candles, or just breathing really hard during exercise. So you can forcefully exhale, um, but that only happens when you're breathing right above normal resting levels, right? So this is what a cross-section of the diaphragm looks like. Um, it attaches to the xiphoid process and the ribs and your lumbar vertebra. And so it's basically making a ring around the entire thoracic cavity. There are openings for major blood vessels um, and the esophagus to get through to get to the stomach. But again, it's like a sheet, like a dome, like a tent. Um, and as long as everything is intact, um, the suction cup pulls the lungs along for the ride. The only time that can go wrong, um, if someone has a puncture wound, like in their chest wall from stabbing or a gunshot or a car accident, um, if you open that up, you can actually get air pockets forming right inside the body because now the suction or the vacuum pulls air in from the outside world. Um, in a healthy person, of course, that should never happen, and our lungs just keep rising and falling up and down the thoracic cavity, All right? That cavity um, illustrated looks something like this. All right, so we've got a couple things to name here. 
the the lining of the lungs uh, we call the visceral pleura. Um, consider that the outer border of lung tissue. And the lining of the chest wall, like just inside the ribs, uh, we call that the parietal pleura. Right? And it's incredibly small, but technically there is a tiny little space there. Right? So that space between the parietal and visceral pleura, you call the pleural cavity. Um, and the pleural cavity always has a very slight negative pressure. The reason for that is the lungs are basically always trying to cave in because they're kind of stretchy, right? They have elastic recoil. Um, the lungs trying to collapse in creates that negative pressure. And we don't really have to care about what exactly that number is. It's usually negative three, four, five, somewhere in there. Um, the point is that negative pressure prevents the lungs from collapsing because the more they try to cave inward, um, the more negative that number would get making a vacuum. That's what's basically keeping the lungs suspended in place in the thoracic cavity, right? So what we expect to happen is when a person inhales and exhales, their lungs get bigger, they get smaller. The lungs are effectively sliding up and down, right, between the parietal and visceral pleura. Um, so th there's not really much of a space there. Think of it almost like two sheets of plastic with soapy water in between them. Um, that thin little sliver of space where the soapy water is, um, is allowing... Um, the lungs to slide up and down. And that only happens because of our pressure changes. Okay? So this is basically summarizing everything that I talked about in the previous slide for inhalation. Diaphragm contracts, lung volume goes up, um, air flows in because we have a pressure gradient from high to low. Um, that is inhalation. And it's all just following Boyle's law. Um, which is saying that pressure and volume have an inverse relationship to each other. Pressure um, goes up when volume goes down, and pressure goes down when volume goes up. Right? We're just manipulating that to control whether air is flowing in versus out of the lungs. Right. Okay, so that's the mechanics of how you actually breathe. The next question is, um, how fast do you breathe? So breathing rate, which is the same thing as respiratory rate, is the combination of how um, quickly you breathe and how deeply you breathe. Um, typically, they both go up and down together. And your brain is keeping track of a handful of things. All right, so you have some respiratory centers in the brain um, that mostly live in the medulla and the pons, right near the base of the brain. Those respiratory centers connect to the muscles that cause breathing, right? So these are the intercostal muscles between the ribs. Um, here's the connection to the diaphragm. And obviously, the deeper and faster you breathe, the more stimulation you're going to get coming out of those, those respiratory centers in the brain. The things that your brain cares about when deciding how fast to breathe, um, the most important by far are blood gas levels, oxygen and CO2. And so if you want to stimulate a person to breathe faster, that would happen anytime you have low oxygen, high CO2, um, or low pH, right? Low pH meaning acidic, All right? Those things go together. When you're exercising, um, you're using oxygen, so O2 goes low. You're producing CO2, so CO2 levels get high. And CO2 acts like an acid pH-wise. We'll get to that later in another video. Those three things are the hallmarks of needing to breathe faster. Low oxygen, high CO2, acidic. Now, when it comes down to it, your brain cares about CO2 more than the others, right? So high levels of CO2 are the most potent stimulant for breathing faster. And the reason is entirely because of the pH connection. CO2 acts like an acid. And remember, um, acidity is much more dangerous than having low oxygen. If someone asked you, would you rather be hypoxic for a few minutes, like low O2, or be acidic for a few minutes, you take the low oxygen any day, because you can recover from that and you'll be fine eventually. If you're acidic for even a matter of seconds, um, acid denatures proteins, it's irreversible, cause permanent brain damage. And so oxygen is a big deal, but um, CO2 is the more damaging one because of the pH connection. Right. In addition to that, um, you also have receptors in skeletal muscles. So if you start exercising, they stimulate faster breathing because you're anticipating being low on oxygen and making more CO2 soon. 
and um, it can be inhibited by stretch in the lungs. If you fill your lungs too full, take a very deep breath, you get that kind of uncomfortable feeling that you want to let it out. Um, that's basically stopping you from over contracting the muscles and doing damage. All right, hope this is helpful. Um, follow along in the playlist. We're going to move through a handful of respiratory videos, and um, the next one is going to cover surfactant and its role in um, lung compliance.